want to um, thank Nakia for being here today, and I want to introduce Nakia. Um, I'm the Associate Director for ENI, and I work closely with all the partners that we talked about today, Erica Bracey and Denise Griffin. And so I just want to talk a little bit about Nakia, um, who is actually Dr. Nakia Benicio. He doesn't usually use a doctor, but I'm going to highlight it today. Um, he's a senior research faculty at Georgia Tech um, at the ENI um, GI Squared, or um, Enterprise Innovation Institute. He's a principal at Venture Lab and the director of the Center for Medtech Excellence. And that's just three of the jobs that Nikia has. He has about 50 more um, that I always um, chide him about. He works with entrepreneurs to execute on their ideas while guiding them in the total startup journey from product development and selling to the government to their go-to-market strategy. Um, he also works with startups on their customer discovery to scaling a company and to also getting capital. He has worked with more than 700 startups. I think that number has actually changed. I think you're over a thousand now. Um, worldwide, with more than 15,000 15, hours of classroom time working with entrepreneurs. And so please join us and welcome online as well. Welcome to the This is cool. Sorry all those that are online, because man, we got all the sandwiches for us today, right? <laughs> that we get a chance to take back. But yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you about models for startup funding. And there's just a bit of a process that I want to walk you guys through. So it's a bit of stories, a bit of kind of use cases, some examples, you know, because oftentimes we talk about funding, but we don't talk about the context in which you need to be in in order to get funding, right? Because everything is so about, well, I need money to run my business, but then you don't even have a customer, right? You need money to run your business, but you're not even incorporated, right? So there's just some fundamental things that we just, I want to spend some time just kind of walking us through. And it'll be kind of a weave, a thread um, that will kind of, and that will end in the culmination of just really, um, with some really good examples in terms of just models for startup funding. I will first say this, the road to success is not easy, right? Uh, we would like to think that that climb is just really simple, it's really easy, but it's not. It is a hard when you're talking about building a startup, uh, especially in today's climate. So we need to make sure that we are doing our due diligence and making sure that we're putting our company and our startup in the best possible place to succeed and to thrive um, as a startup. So again, the road to success can be somewhat of an arduous one but the companies that are properly prepared do eventually make it through that. So let's talk about some funding sources. I mean, we all have some understanding of, you know, you get money from venture capitalists, you get money from banks, um, these all these traditional sources and where you get money from. But let's talk a little bit about in terms of where does most important funding sources come from when we think about in the terms of the world of startups, right? It comes from customers. We always tell the best investor is a customer. So no matter how great you think your technology is or how great you think the resources or product or services that you're trying to provide, the best investor will always be a customer first, right? And if you can identify customers that are willing to actually pay for your business, meaning that you have revenue equals customers versus impact, that's going to be the first and most important source uh, as it relates to startup funding, so to be. Because I guarantee you this, if you have customers and you have a scalable, repeatable, strong business, finding investors will not be a hard thing for you to get uh, in terms of that. So, but we have to make sure that we put all this in context when we're talking about finding our startup funders. So there's a couple of broad categories, right? We could start off with just obviously start out with competitions and, and founders and family endowments and corporate dollars and there's government funding that's associated but well, we have to think in terms of where is our business, right? And I don't care whether you're selling a t-shirt or you're selling some high grade rocket fuel to send Elon back to the moon or wherever he came from, right? Um, it all requires some sense of funding. So when we think in terms of the motivation behind um, some of these institutions, we have this thing called angel and investor groups and venture capitals or banks and financial institutions. And these are just some of the categories in terms of who actually funds startups and where you get some of these fundings from. 
And then, of course, there's other various and motivation in other vehicles. Um, it says family and friends here, but there should be fools down there and idiots. Um, because anytime you, you have an idea and you want to convince someone to give you $100,000 and you don't have a customer, yeah, you're certainly an idiot or a fool. Uh, it should fall into that category. Not to offend anyone, just a little humor there. Uh, but when we think in terms of crowdfunding, accelerators, and incubators, um, and impact funds, there is one on here that I have not mentioned, and that's large NGOs. And what a large NGO is, it's like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? Now they fund larger things, larger items like global health issues and that kind of stuff in terms of, so there are NGOs out there um, like a Bill and Melinda Gates, a Kauffman Foundation, these, funders, these funders that actually fund organizations that have larger global missions, right? Um, your business may not necessarily mean it's going for some product or service or an impact, but it does serve as a larger mission. So just, just consider that as we kind of navigate through this process. When we think in terms of just breaking it down into grants, debt, and equity, and I'll unpack all of this in a little bit and just kind of go through this. When we think of the goals of the grant, right, it's capital to achieve a specific milestone or, or mission or often tied to a specific project or purpose um, that must be reported upon. So grants are great mechanisms when in terms of we're talking about looking for funding and standing up projects. And what I'm starting to see in this day and age is that you're seeing the intersection between entrepreneurship research and universities more than ever before, where now you've got government institutions are now looking to figure out how do we come alongside to better support our entrepreneurs to help to grow the economy. Because the reality of it is, a small business is the one that employs most of people in the country, right? So we have to figure out how do we figure out the pathways to making sure that if we can leverage grants, what does leveraging a grant and what does that whole component, um, that what does that whole component look like from a, uh, from a debt standpoint? I mean, that could, a grant standpoint. And then obviously there's the debt aspect of it, right? And I'll make sure you all have these slides. I won't literally, I won't bore you with reading the dissertation of every single thing <laughs> that I put on the slide, but just to really highlight the poignant points for you as we navigate through this. And then there's debt, which provided the working capital and capital expenditures in return for principal or interest, right? That's obviously you go to a bank, you got some equity, um, they give you, you know, a loan, right? In terms of, or you got some type of investment, angel investment, they take some type of equity in your business. And that's how we classify that in terms of debt. Or we think from the prospect of capital, right? Capital provided for operational expenses and capital expenditures and returns for a share or ownership in your company, which is kind of a little bit like, not necessarily debt, but it's equity, right? You know, you say, hey, I'm going to give you, you know, a million dollars, we want seven or 8% back of your business, right? And I will tell you this, all of you are students, VC math does not add up to the math that you learned in high school and college. Two plus two does not equal four in the VC world, right? So when you start doing the multiples on the dollars and how much you have to grow into that, um, all of that fundamentally changes. So we need to make sure that we understand that uh, for context. And so, and then as we think in terms of just the stages, and I'll walk, I'll walk a little deeper into this, the later into the slide deck on how do you create a funding strategy and what types of dollars you should be thinking about depending on the stage that you're in. Because you got some startups that are at the very early stage, but then they're looking at talking about, I want serious A money, but you're not at that serious A place, right? So we'll put a little bit of context. So when we think in terms of pre-revenue stage companies versus revenue stage companies, and I'm sure all of you have heard this pre versus post, uh, in that context. So this is kind of my definitions of what that actually looks like. You know, excluding the left in terms of the milestones, your tech innovation, your business stage, your team stage versus your capital stage. Funding is a strategy, right? And you need to understand fundamentally where your business is in terms of what kind of capital you're trying to actually pursue. So when we think in the pre-revenue stage, it's really just having a single focus on understanding what the ideal is, how do you begin the process of prototyping it, and then what is the business model that helps you fundamentally validate that business model to make sure that you're testing the right thing, depending on kind of where it is, right? And so as you begin the process of thinking that, if you notice here, it's all the things that you hear us talk regularly about, 
customer discovery. What is your value proposition? I know Risha always is probably hammering you in. Who's your customer? What is the value, right? What are they getting out of this, right? And when I say value, I'm not talking about something that comes in green or purple. I'm talking about something that's unique to that industry and something that is a differentiator between what other competitors are doing, something that separates you from everyone else that you can build a successful, strong business out of, right? And so just understanding in, in that pre-revenue stage, these are some of the fundamental things that you will have to work through. Some of your very early on hires, right? Some of your, your CTOs. And so I'm setting a little bit of phase, a little bit of the stage before we actually jump into the different models um, to give you context as we navigate through this. And then when we think about like the revenue stage, right? That's kind of the production, the iteration. You're kind of out there on the market now, right? And you've got a little bit of revenue beyond the capital that you've actually raised. Um, you've got a proven business model that works. It's profitable. You've got the right organizational structure, the executive leadership values and culture, right? That's if you notice that's in the stage when you start getting into the series A, B and C, right? And I'll unpack that again later in the presentation. Um, in terms of what that looks like. But I always think it gives context when you look in terms of non-dilutive versus equity versus debt to really understand kind of where your business is in terms of where you want it to be to have some strategy on how you go about the process of raising money. Because not all businesses are venture back, backable businesses, right? Some businesses need to go a traditional route and that's perfectly okay. Money is money, last time I heard, right? Uh, just because it came from a venture capitalist or a bank, it's the same $100, right? As long as it gets you to the place that where you need to, that's the most important thing as it relates to that. So what I would like you all to do, and not don't have to do it now, but just in your own time, map your potential sources. What do you think you need dollars from? Begin to think through this after you hear everything I'm saying in terms of the presentation so that you can have a good context in where funding is coming from for you and how do you actually go about that process. Again, when you think of some equity sources from an angel investor and you think about it in this context, angel investors are high net worth individuals um, investing in their own, investing their own money, um, usually in industries that are familiar to them. So not all endangered investors will invest in any and all and everything, right? So you need to understand just much like venture capitalists have an investment thesis, individual angel investors have their own personal interests and in types of companies they like to step in. Usually this is kind of the first round, first money that you kind of get in that regard. Like I said, I won't read everything, but you guys will have the slides um, for your deeper digest in. And if there's additional questions after, um, I'll make sure I'll leave room so that we can have more of a conversation with each other. And then when you think of VC dollars, right, whereas professional managers of, of the fine pool of other people's money, and I'll unpack what that means as well. And these are typically like in your Series A or your later round, so to speak, right? These are people who actually raise money from other people. Did you not know that VCs are startups themselves, right? They have to go raise money so that they can in turn give you money, <laughs> right? Uh, and so th it's a bit of a process. So just keep in mind that you as the founder are always in the best possible position. But there are some things that you have to do to make sure that you are a success. And we're going to highlight a couple of those things and how you characterize your business. And then there's strategic, there's strategic money, right? Larger corporations investing strategically in smaller companies um, and their industry or various of reasons. And I'll talk about that as well a little later. But these are companies that may be like a UPS where you have some supply chain technology and they have an investment arm, they want interest in that technology. So the corporation themselves make the direct investment into you as a startup, right? So just some things when you think about from a strategic investment standpoint, uh, but it's important to understand in terms of where you are and where they are. And so what is equity? We hear this a lot, right? This means very different things. Does it mean giving your kids or your kidney <laughs> or some of the things that you think about or giving up all your sandwiches um, or, or your potato chips? It means that literally you're giving up, to summarize it, you're giving up a piece of your business in order to get some dollars to grow. Now, I will say this, be very careful early on in the dollars that you take, whether it be debt or equity, right? Because if you're not careful in that, um, I will tell you this, if you don't have the right business model to sustain the growth, the dollars you're on taking, it'll be very difficult, especially if you're taking debt, then you add on the burden of potentially ruining your life and ruining your credit and all those things, right? As opposed to VC dollars, if your business doesn't work out, um, worst case scenario, you just got a bad reputation, you probably never raise money ever again, right? So, but when we think in terms of just the equity component, 
uh, it, it's critical. So you need to understand the equity split among yourselves and your founders and your companies as you're building and growing your business. Because you don't want to give away too much equity very early on. And then when you get into your later rounds um, and you're trying to grow your business and you can take on, keep taking on so much debt, so much debt, you know, I always see founders that always brag about, I have the exit and they're super excited about the exit. But the only thing they got out of the business was $100,000 in a car. They sold the business for $100 million, but the only thing they got was 100 grand in a car, right? Because they gave up so much equity and tried to raise so much money to get the growth and they misinterpreted that what that meant. So they celebrate the exit but they failed in terms of building something that was successful and building long-term sustainable wealth. So we have to learn how to manage um, that. But that's another conversation, another topic uh, on how to navigate that component. So when you think of, you know, according to the Kauffman Foundation, over 500,000 plus new companies formed each year in the U.S. 4,000 of them uh, are, are, are startup. I mean, 4,000 um, are startups funded with equity each year, according to PitchBook. Not all startups need equity, and that's okay, right? When you think out of 500,000, only 700 exits, according to Pitchfork, that's, all, that's not a lot, right? When you think of the month. So it's like almost like saying, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to high, I'm gonna play basketball in high school, then I'm going to go to college, and I'm definitely going to be drafted to the NBA. If you look at the statistics of that, it's very low, right? The chances of you of that actually happening, right? And so it's, it, you think of it in context of raising money. It is a very difficult thing. Um, especially in the climate that we're in right now when we're talking about raising actual dollars. And, but, but having a good understanding of your customer, the value that you're delivering in your market will help ensure, uh, if nothing else, you'll have a customer to self-fund yourself. And if you're successful and lucky enough to end up eventually raising money to grow a successful business. So you hear these words, convertible notes and safe notes. I'm just only talk about it briefly. I'm not going to go too in-depth with it, but I'm just, again, setting a little context before we get into the models of funding. So there are some, you know, convertible notes of pros and cons in terms of that, right? You know, delay of price in the company, um, an interest bearing loan that is intended to convert into equity upon a qualified financing um, and an incentive to go to the, for the funder, either at a discount or a price cap, right? So it's basically saying, I'm giving you X amount of dollars. To summarize it in short, what eventually happens is that if after certain periods of time, that debt that money turns into actual equity, and then now they own an ownership in your particular company. So I'll give you an instance. So let's just say you take a convertible note at 7%, <laughs> right? And you get $150,000. Seems great, and you're all excited. But then in your contract, it says we own 25% of your company now <laughs> once it converts into equity, right? So now you went from 7 to 20% and only at $100,000, $150,000, right? So when I say when we start doing the math on these things, right, we have to be very careful in terms of the dollars that we take um, in, in that regard. So just wanted to just highlight that, but I'm not going to go through, again, all the details. But they're very fast to execute. But our, our most price rounds, not to, right, in that regard. When we think in terms of just the whole aspect of why we do this, you see this very common, um, like why Combinator uses this method a lot in terms of convertible notes, right? And there are some pros and cons with that. And, and my suggestion is if you're navigating through this and you're taking a, a, a term sheet or you're taking a, a convertible note, see, speak with an attorney, right? Sit down, talk through, make sure you understand all the legal aspects of that before you take in money, and whether it's a convertible note or a loan in general, make sure you always have good legal counsel um, as you navigate through that. When we think in terms of the safe note, it's a simple agreement for future equity is what a safe note actually stands for. Um, it's simple, uh, too simple, but the no downside is, is there's no um, protection for the investor in that regard. So it's very hard to get true seasoned investors to agree um, to a safe note, um, but it's widely offered by economic firms and accelerators because um, they're looking to get companies in. These are accelerators that typically do have some funding that are attached. And so they use typically a safe note or a convertible note as a vehicle uh, to provide funding into startups with the hope that they're going to get high net worth startups that will exit for really, really large amounts of dollars, which will in turn allow them to be very successful. So when we think about, so now let's switch speeds a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the economic value creation for a second. And I'm going to tell you why we're going to talk about the economic value creation for a moment. Because we need to understand that as you begin to build and grow your particular business, you need to understand the value. Because in most cases, I don't care what business it is, you're either going to, your customer has to have two options, right? 
continue what they're doing or stop what they're doing and do and, and onboard to you, right? So there's a stop of switching costs to onboarding you. So we need to understand what is the economic value creation in terms of the switching costs associated to this. And every business needs to remotely understand that when we're thinking in terms of how do we grow and how do we scale our individual business? So what do I mean by that? So the value creation isn't only the thing that influences the buyer's decision, but the economic value creation plays a major role in positioning your value proposition to your customer acquisition, right? It's positioning the value of who you are, your product to your customer. And the reason why I'm going through this first is because this context, context matters when we talk about money and business and growth. Because if you don't have context, it makes it very difficult to know what dollars to take. And then we make the assumption that money is going to be the answer to everything when we're not at the right place at the right time. So when we talk about the value, econ uh, value economic creation, we got to ask ourselves, why will your customers pay you, right? Why would they buy you? Why would they buy your service? Why would they use you, right? What is the why behind that? Do you understand the differentiation between you and your competitor? And will they use your service as opposed to someone else? And again, all this is a build upon to when we jump into the models um, for startup funding. So we have to have a bit of a framework when we talk about the economic value creation and just uh, outlining that. And it starts with just understanding these simple things, right? The questions spent, how much are your customers currently paying to solve the problem? Now, the loss. How much money are your customers losing by not solving the problem now? Save, how much money could your customers save with your solution? Or switching, how much money will it cost for them to switch to your solution? Or available, how much money does the customer have available to spend, right? This is all goes back to understanding the customer, the archetype, the persona of your customer, who's bank, who's buying, who's paying um, for your, uh, for your um, services, so we have context matters. So let's look at spent for a moment. So if we take how much a customer is currently paying to solve a problem and just use this example of better, an e team um, developing an adjustable bra for breastfeeding um, women. So now let's look at the cost, $300 for bras and an economic value proposition is what they're proposing. So women's breasts fluctuate three to five cup sizes while breastfeeding. Uh, new mothers up to buying an average of six new bras on an average bra cost of $50. So breastfeeding mothers end up spending $300 on a bra. You get the kind of the theme that I'm trying to say. You have to understand the consumer, the economic outcome, the buyer, understand that buyer's journey, that pathway behind why they build it. So remember when I said early, early on, your customer is your best investor, right? So you need to understand the economics behind your actual customer. So now let's move to save. So how much could the customer save with your solution? So staying with the same example. So the better, if the e team uh, uh, developing an adjustable bra for breastfeeding women, currently the mothers are spend $300 for six bras. We've priced our product at $75. Customers buy two of our products. Customers will save $150, saving customers $150 in an economic value proposition. So now we went from costing them money, the money that they had available to spend to actually saving them money. This is where we get into the differentiation between our value, our competitor's value, and to who eventually ends up being our customer. These things are all matter, right? Context matters when we're talking about building a business and being in a place that where we can take on additional funding um, as we grow. So now let's talk about an example of switching and the cost associated to that. And I'm talking about your customer because they're the ultimate economic buyer, um, the ultimate economic value and to you as a business. How much money will it cost for them to switch to your solution? So let's take Flux Marine developed a market electric uh, um, outboard motors um, for marine industry. Um, so the competitive uh, product costs between six and $20,000. If customers already have a motor, this can sunk in the cost. Flux must think about trade-in options, incentives, and life cycles. When customers have an appetite for a flux motor, so we think in terms of spending the additional six to twelve dollars in economic value proposition, how will the venture make switching financially feasible and desirable? Right. So you can't just assume because you price something that that's the customer's, you know, comfortable zone. We have to think through the economic concerns and considerations of our customer when we're creating our product. 
all of you should know this and be competing with this as you navigate through your customer discovery process. And then we think in terms of how much money does the customer have available? Can they afford your product? Can they afford your solution? So we take this uh, uh, Phenomix, accessible um, needle delivery system for bio sealant used during um, trans um, lung biopsies is for instance, uh, there are reimbursement codes attached to this. The CMS reimbursement code is $582. The customers are already spending $315 on a competitive product. So if $382 is the reimbursement in an economic value proposition, then what is it gonna cost in terms of how much money does the customer have available to spend on your solution, right? So don't price yourself out, it's the point that I'm trying to make here, is that pricing becomes very difficult when we're talking about building a startup. Price yourself right, you're a rock star. Price yourself wrong, you'll self cannibalize your business. And then it's a domino effect to have to go raise more money, borrow more money, just to keep up because you didn't price yourself right. So it's about being smart about our business and how we manage ourselves. Yes. A question about pricing. Is that something you test and iterate on? Absolutely. You just like you test do customer discovery around you know your product, you got to test your pricing as well too. So you got. So you have like a business or service. So I've got a good or service that you're trying to sell, but it's not selling. Is that an indication for the price? Um, it could be a multi. It could be various of things, right? It could be. It could be that. Uh, or it could just be, it's a nice to have and not a must to have, right? It could be, there's just no market for it, right? It could be just, you know, or you might have the wrong customer segment that intends to, you know, you've got the wrong value aligned to the wrong customer. And so we have to figure out how do we align those those particular things, right? So it could be a multiple things in that regard, That's right? Right, so when we think in terms of loss, how much money are your customers losing by not solving the problem? When you think of this maturity sensor for reducing fruit and vegetable waste, the average loss packer, um, loses 1.2 uh, million in apples every year. The Streller takes um, guesswork out of maturity sensing. So 1.2 million expenses in economic value proposition. So the Streller can base price on how much they can save on the $1.2 million of expenses, right? So thinking also how much money will the customer lose and how much can you save? And we're going back again to characterizing your value proposition to make sure that we have a sticky value proposition, so to speak, so that we can have somewhat of our predictable revenue. Just something to think about. So again, closing with the framework. And so some of the questions asked, spent, how much are the customers currently paying to solve the problem? Lost, how much money are the customers losing by not solving the problem today? Saved, how much money could customers save with your solution? And switching, how much money will it cost for them to switch to your solution or available? How much money does the customer have available to them today? These are things to kind of consider. Again, when I do these presentations, I'd like to set context before we jump into it. Because if we just go straight to it, it won't make sense. So we're almost to jumping into the models of funding for startup for funding. But I just want to, again, walk through a couple of things that you all should be thinking about as company. So when we think about the competitive analysis of the landscape, you know, lots of startups fail. What do you all think the percentage uh, fail from being out uh, competed? What do you think the percentage is? Or 95. I'll say 99. Oh, 99. Okay. Well, it's about <laughs> it's about 19. Uh, but when you think in terms of the top reasons why startup fail, is it you, what we just were mentioning here? No market need, right? You build something that nobody wants, and and it's okay to have a passion product, a project. It's okay to be passionate about entrepreneurship, but at the end of the day, you, you started a business because you wanted to make money, right? And so we have to figure out uh, how we're gonna go about doing that. Uh, or when you look at the top three here, the second is I ran out of cash or not the right team. Interesting, right? Not having the right team helping you be able to make money. So just can't be cognizant of kind of having awareness in where your company is. And I don't care what product it is, whether you're selling t-shirts, or whether you're sharing some drug, it doesn't matter, right? Context matters, and having a good understanding of your customer is really important. Reasons why startups fail, no space, um, no space, no market, no niche for the fill, no place for commercial pathway for your, for your business, right? Or know-how, not compelling solution, no differentiation that matters to your customer. You're offering the same solution that someone else down the street is offering, right? So the value cannot be on we're cheaper, faster, better. The value has to be on something that's so unique because that's how you capture value. That's how you build a sustainable, successful business that launches and scales um, 
uh, for, uh, for, for growth there. And then we think in terms of, you know, who else has been there before? Ask yourself this question. The question that you ask, who else has tried to solve this problem before? Who is the, who is the competitor uh, there uh, now and for direct or indirect competitors in terms of your business? What are the current offerings not enough or wrong in that regard, right? Where are the market gaps? What are the market trends? And who says it's not broken or shouldn't even change, right? You all should know all these things and every single business has these particular trends. And it's important that you understand where these market trends are in terms of your business to make sure that you are solving the right business. So a couple of examples here in terms of just a competitive analysis in, um, in that regard. So this particular company, Remora, building networks for autonomous surf level marine drones that gather um, floating trash and data around the, the, the clock, right? So as they started out their business, they had to look in terms of what was the competitive landscape with their particular competitors. All of you should know where your competitors are, right? Good, bad, low, and high. Where do you differentiate yourself and how do you set the value for your business? Again, I don't care if it's Nike competing against Adidas, all of them differentiate their value so that they make sure that they're targeting their own individual customer segment. So this is a good competitive analysis, right? They have a good assessment of their company. All of you, I'm in charge of all of you to think through this um, as we get to that. And then it could be even better if they add a quantification to it in terms of how much better they are than their competitor, right? You know, I know all of you want me to just jump straight into the Cuba Good Jr. show me the money, but I'm gonna put a little context before we show you the money, right? Because if you understand how doing these simple things help better put you in a position to make money um, and to be sustainable, you'll be that much more stronger as a business. So now they were able to differentiate. Remember before when it says not a compelling enough differentiation? So now adding a quantification to it and their competitive analysis helps them to have a strong enough differentiation between them themselves and their customers. And so let's just look at another example. AI risk, um, which addresses problem for diabetic retinopathy in underserved communities by developing a low cost retinal imaging system that can diagnose eye disease without direct supervision of a specialist. Now, these are actual world startups that I've actually worked with, right? So these are just wonderful examples, but they've been through a process of customer discovery, sitting in lectures like this to better understand their customer landscape before, this is all the stuff you do before you start raising money, right? Because these are the questions that these are <laughs> they're gonna ask you uh, as we get to the point of uh, talking about the money component. And so this was their original competitive analysis, right? It's good and checking off and saying, here's all our competitors, which is great. UK, you check more boxes than your actual competitor. But when we start to think about it in terms of where's the real value in dollars and where does it add up? When we look at their competitive analysis and they reduce it. So now if they take their competitive analysis and they're looking at where they differentiate themselves from their competitor, now they can sit in front of an investor and say, well, we're 96.67% more accurate than our competitor. Our competitor is not this accurate, right? So these are the things that I'm talking about that you have to clarify and understand better about your business when we're talking about setting differentiation. And so another example, as we um, get ready to jump into uh, the models for, stun, uh, for funding, in this example is solar pickle technology, lighting and connectivity solutions for low uh, middle income countries. So this was a company that was trying to figure out how do they provide accurate lighting for their particular company? So they went through multiple designs, multiple design iterations to make sure that they had the right solution, right? Keeping their competitors in mind. Some of them may not have access to power. Some of them may need access to other solutions to power their light device, right? Think from the customer's perspective. Never lead with what you think is best. Think from the customer's perspective. This is what's gonna make you successful. So their competitive analysis was to uh, against their competitive matrix, against their competitor was obviously here, you know, more power, more time, cheaper costs um, in terms of just what, in terms of what they're trying to offer, more storage, more reliability. I think you kind of get the point in terms of the competitive analysis and how you need to make sure you're differentiating yourself from your customers. A couple things to remember. Sometimes you are, are optimizing technical features with will you deliver customer benefits, but haven't achieved them yet, right? or try the best to define and quantify your customer benefits as much as possible. Um, you need to shoot for the metrics that matter, uh, make you the best solution, but also 
different solution from what your competitors are doing out there. You need to use customer discovery to validate that the performance metrics are that you are focusing on matter the most to your customer. Again, you keep hearing the word customer because that's the thing that's important. So now as we switch gears again, the journey is the reward as a startup. Uh, as you navigate through this, now that we set a little bit of context, now let's talk about some of the work you need to do and understand funding mechanisms and funding priorities as you begin to, to understand that. Again, the journey is the reward. Don't get so enamored with the technology or focus on the raising the money, but focus on your creating something that's good and better for the world, um, whatever your technology or your solution is. So the question I ask for you is, is how much to get you to the next meaningful milestone? That's a question that an investor will ask you or a banker will even ask you. How much money do you need and why do you need that money? What does this money get you to where and why? So my first question to you as a startup is, have you thought through what types of funding streams do you need? And if you notice, I love questions, right? Have you thought through the revenue you generate from each of your customer segments? Do you have an outline of how much money does it take for you to run as a business? And what types of transactions does your business run off of? If it's, is it SaaS, is it transactional, is it recurring? What does the business model look like? Because that's all going to govern the kind of models or funding in which you're able and have the capacity to kind of take them. So some questions that you should ask yourself, what current funding streams do you currently have now as a business? Are there funding streams that you can, ease, that, that you can get easily? Um, what funding streams are you hoping to get in the future? And what value is each customer segment willing to pay for your particular solution? Then start to think through what are the physical key resources that is needed for your business to thrive? whether it's physical, intellectual, human, or financial? What are the resources that's required for your business to actually be a success? Do you need a physical building? Do you need a warehouse? Do you need to manufacture something? Do you need to have someone manufacture your product for you? What are the resources and the key things that have to happen in your business? These are the things that help set the stage for when you start to ask for money, because these are things that you need to have prepared when we're talking about making sure that we're heading in the right direction. And then the costs, what are the costs in terms of that are, are occurred to operate your product or your process? Tell me a little bit about those costs. Are they fixed costs, variable costs, um, economies of scale, economies of scope, um, beneficiary costs? Um, are you beneficiary, cost-driven, value-driven, or both? Tell me a little bit about how your costs show up in your business and some questions to ask yourself. Does this financially make sense? How much money is actually being spent? You'd be surprised how many startups don't know how much money they're actually spending. They don't really know how much money is coming in versus how much money is coming out. Can't tell you the cost of goods and services. Can't tell you the customer acquisition costs. Can't tell you the lifetime value of their customer. These are things you need to understand if you're talking about predicting and forecasting how successful your business will actually be. And then other resources, most important assets required to make the product process or solution work. Again, do you need some physical uh, uh, physical building, intellectual property, finances? Some questions to ask yourself. What resources do you already have? You'd be surprised how many startups can growth hack their business and don't need dollars to do that. There's so many tools out there that can help you grow your business. I am always advocating, let's growth hack this thing first. Let's get customers and then use growth and finances and VC money in the proper way for growth and for scale to help us to get to the next level. Uh, what key resources do you need um, to own, if any? Um, what do you need to acquire? What do you need financial resources? Do you need human capital? Ask yourself these questions. Again, you will have these slides, but it's important that you ask yourself these questions because these are questions that will be asked of you when you start asking the money question, when you start asking people for money. Partnerships. Do you need partners to help you deliver your business? You may build or manufacture something, but does a partner have access to a customer that you want to sell to? So you create a t-shirt, but then you want access to an end user. That customer may have access to a store that buys your product that gets it to your end user, right? So understanding the workflow, the throughput of how your technology, your solution, your, your product is gets to your individual customers. Now, I love showing this particular slide because it's kind of eye-opening. I do a lot of work in the defense space and work with startups and companies to try to sell into the defense space. Now, 
if you look at this, now, if you were to tell me that I'm going to sell a technology that sells into the Department of Defense, and I show this because it's an extreme example, because this is literally the process that they have to go through. He's looking at it like, what? He can forget it. I'm not selling anything to these folks, right? But it's a process. And the reason I'm showing you this is because you need to understand your customer's buyer's journey and the process, not only just your customer, but you need to understand the channels in which you sell your product in, right? You need to understand the distribution channels and how all these things work. For this is a very complicated slide. Uh, I know how to navigate it, but the average startup doesn't, right? So you need to make sure that you understand how to navigate your ecosystems and how to navigate your distribution channels, how to navigate your product from you to your customers.